Long before the lumber industry first roared to life, the Allagash was a wild, primitive place, the home and hunting grounds of the Wabanaki Indian tribes. The decline in the Native American population of the area coincided with the rise of the lumber industry in the first half of the 19th century, a time when the Allagash became known for a seemingly endless supply of virgin pine and spruce. Reminders of the waterway's proud working heritage can be seen throughout the park. This particular site right we're at right now, Churchill Dam, was a once called Churchill Depot. It was the center of logging activities in the whole Allagash region. We've consolidated a lot of the artifacts, the logging artifacts, from the whole waterway and brought them here at Churchill to display for the public. This is a, what we call the Churchill Depot History Center. And in here we have a bateau from the 1930s. We have this dump wagon right behind me. Matter of fact, there's an old washing machine that my wife used to use when we worked up here in the uh, late uh, 70s and early 80s. There is a lot of history here connected with uh, logging. At one time, the dam here at Churchill would generate power for the little community that was here with two schools, a French school and an English-speaking school. And uh, there was quite a, quite a settlement right here at this location. Directly across the river from the museum, you'll find a boarding house once known for providing shelter for generations of hard-working lumbermen. It was built somewhere around the turn of the century, early 1900s, and it would house the, the logging crews that worked here. One end of the building also had some private rooms, and one of them was Helen Hamlin, who wrote the book Nine Mile Bridge, stayed in that very room and uh, was, was here in the, uh, in the later 1930s, and she taught school here to the, to the kids that were, were living here. It was French, there was a French school and an English school. Other fascinating historic landmarks are scattered throughout the waterway. Telos Dam is one of them. Lock Dam is another. This dam right here is what actually changed the flow of the, the south end of the waterway. Everything on this side of the dam flows north, down the Allagash into the St. John. Everything on this side of the dam flows south, down into the east branch and to the Penobscot, and then down into the Penobscot Bay down in Bangor. And this river runs north, runs to Canada. And once the, and it was acted at the same time, there was a boundary dispute on where the actual boundary between Maine and Canada was. So once the logs went north, they were out of the control of American interests. So down on Chamberlain, they actually built a dam at the natural outlet of Chamberlain Lake, which would have ran into Eagle Lake, Churchill Lake, and down the Allagash, and forced the water south. The construction of this dam was a critically important turning point in the development of the lumber industry in the 19th century. The stone tools of First Nation eventually gave way to axes and crosscut saws. Logging activity accelerated in the mid-1800s and early 1900s, and without question, the spruce and pine logs cut in the Allagash watershed during the early boom years were a significant contributor to the success of the lumber and paper industry in Maine. The lakes and rivers of Maine were once the highways that delivered logs and pulpwood to the mills. Steam-powered transportation helped facilitate the explosive growth of the lumber industry during the early 1900s. Several relics of the bygone era of steam transportation attract visitors to historic sites along the shores of the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. The Tramway Historic District consists of a strip of land 3,000 feet long running between the western shore of Eagle Lake and the northeastern shore of Chamberlain Lake. Placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979, the Tramway Historic District is the only property within the waterway given this distinguished recognition. This fascinating stretch of land contains the remains of the unique log conveying tramway built in 1903. The tramway consists of 6,000 feet of continuous wire cabling, most of which now rest on the ground along with remnants of the tramway's steam engine and boilers. During its heyday, the tramway operated from 1903 to 1909. We are at the Chamberlain end of the tramway, the 3,000 feet that separate two drainages, which would be the Allagash drainage headed north and the uh, Penobscot drainage headed south. So the goal would be again to, to bring uh, logs, we're talking 16-foot logs, to Bangor 
to the sawmills in Bangor. And this would facilitate Elagash spruce and pine logs being cut up as far as Churchill Dam, put on this tram, which is behind me, which is a, just basically a mini railroad with a return line underneath it with a 6,000 foot cable. And then they would drop logs into uh, Chamberlain Lake over there and then drive them down the east branch of the Penobscot. Transporting logs out of the Allagash Wilderness Waterway required innovation and ingenuity. As those guys brought that in from Greenville and set it up with nothing more than levers, horses, no mechan no cranes, no nothing. And then to set this place up, I think it was for quite a feat for, for its time. For the uninitiated, the abandoned tramway operation is a startling discovery. You're in the middle of the Allengash Wilderness Waterway. You walk up the shore and there's these 200 ton locomotives just sitting 200 feet from the shoreline. And I, I think when you walk up there and see them the first time, you go, wow, what are these doing here? The trains are remnants of the Industrial Revolution in an area so remote, it was more practical to abandon the engines when operations ended than to haul them out of the woods. So today, they remain. Where we are right now, we're about 200 feet from the shore of Eagle Lake. Essentially, 1933 was, what, the Depression hit in 1932, the stock market crashed in 32. And in 33, of course, with the Depression, the demand for paper went down and they didn't need the pulpwood and things kind of went, and they just, and these, these trains were not worth hauling out of the woods, so they just walked away, left them here, left the whole operation right here. And it was like the 13 mile railroad to nowhere but it all has its place in time in the history of the Allagash Wilderness Waterway and the history of the, really of the northern part of the state of Maine. Really, it's a must-see site if you're gonna do the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. Keep in mind the artifacts of the bygone logging era including old tools and machinery, belong to the state of Maine. Please leave the historic artifacts where you find them. Cunliffe Depot is the site of an old logging camp. Remnants of the early operation can still be found here. What I'm sitting on here today is a, uh, a Lombard log hauler made by A.O. Lombard out of Waterville, Maine. They were used to haul wood out of the woods into landings on the Allagash River here. This would pull upwards of eight or 10 sleds behind it filled with, with lumber to go to the landings. The spruce and pine logs cut in the Allagash watershed were a significant contributor to the success of the lumber and paper industry in Maine. The lumber harvesting work of the day called for long hours under often brutally harsh and punishing conditions. They did have a lot of ingenuity. They, uh, they knew how to fix things uh, without much stuff. Um, one thing they did have is they had a lot of manpower. You know, nowadays everything is done machinery. Uh, back then they'd throw four or five men at, at, uh, at one job and get it done. You could not have had a thriving lumber industry unless the hardworking men of the day were fed, and several 19th century farms sprung up to meet the needs of these men. These farms raised livestock and grew crops like potatoes, corn, and oats. Some of the proud descendants of these early farm families still live and work in the Allagash. Where we are right here, we're sitting on the porch at Mitchell Farm Ranger's cabin. It is the site of an old farm that was here. Uh, I have family ties to the Allagash River. Across the river, you had the Moore farm. I'm a direct descendant of the Moors. I am the seventh generation of family members that's either lived, worked, or played on this Allagash Wilderness Waterway. The historic Moore Farm, the ancestral home of so many of today's proud Allagash families. Like many residents of Allagash Village, 
Cale O'Leary traces his family origins back to the Moore Farm site. Cale is an eighth generation descendant of the Moore Farm family. I'm Cale O'Leary, I'm the assistant ranger at the Michel Farm, and I'm the eighth direct descendant from the Moore Farm. The Moore Farm was established in 1837. It consisted of the eight islands um, below the Michaud Farm that you'll encounter on the trip, and about 100 acres on the uh, right hand or east side of the river. George Moore first settled here. He was one of the first loyalist settlers to come down the Allagash River, one of the first families to actually settle on the Allagash River. They were basically farmers, uh, supplied food, uh, lodging to people using the Allagash River, lumbermen. Um, they provided a place to stay for sports using the river as well. Uh, and uh, basically just uh, sustenance farming to sustain themselves, basically. There's two camps here. Uh, in the 1950s, a man by the name of Henry Taylor from Ashland, uh, Ashland, Maine, bought this land and uh, turned it into a guiding service. He built uh, a little lodge and the remnants are still there in a nice stone fireplace uh, just to my right here. We're right here next to the Taylor's camp, the one that's been restored. In the 1950s, if today was the 1950s, I'd be standing in what was Henry Taylor's main lodge. The people using the river, uh, being guided by Henry, would have came to eat uh, supper or just to hang out in the evenings. This is a large stone fireplace that was made from probably rocks just off the bank of the Allagash River right here and constructed sometime around 1940, I would think, 1950. It's still standing today. Uh, a lot of people come and even can still cook their lunch in it and stuff. It's kind of an interesting place and it's just right here next to the uh, Taylor's Restored Camp. So. It is a little eerie, you know, you walk in these woods now and you think that, you know, my great-great-grandfather one time was probably plowing these fields with a team of horses and working here and whenever I see the, the little house that's still, still part of it standing today, I think of his family being born there and my great-great-grandfather, Leo Larry, living there as a young child and it's a, it's a special place for me. I always like to come here and just look around and this spot in particular is very important not only to me but to a lot of people from the town of Allagash because of its historical relevance. This was the first family to settle the Allagash River and a lot of the descendants that are still in Allagash today come from this area and this spot and it really means a lot to a lot of people. So this is an important spot I would think on this section of the river to uh, preserve and restore. For these hard-working pioneers, the good life was lived on this cherished waterway. And the legacy of these early families lives on today. The legacy lives on at the old Michaud Farm, today the site of a ranger station. Moore Farm, otherwise known as the Henry Taylor Camps, is another cherished historic site along the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. Nugent's Camps and the legendary Jalbert Sporting Camps are also much-loved destinations for travelers seeking traditional accommodations in the North Woods. These camps are owned by the state of Maine and leased to the current operators. Nugent's camps offer traditional no-frills cabins on the east shore of Chamberlain Lake. Nugent's camps are named in honor of Al and Patty Nugent, the original proprietors and caretakers of this beautiful site. Al and Patty Nugent had a dream of, of operating some camps in the Allagash. He was working for Great Northern Paper at the time, and he went to Telos Landing. There was a road into the waterway, the south, very south end of the waterway called Telos Landing. He built a raft, he bought a bunch of provisions and, and put them on this raft, and including a wood stove, and floated them up to Chamberlain Lake. And made the trip overnight, basically built the shelter that first summer and, and, uh, and started building these these cabins. It was pretty rough for the first couple of years, I guess. They basically built a lean-to for that first winter. He knew what he was doing. He picked a public lot to build those camps on. They actually settled on the public lot, which was strategic in that the paper company wouldn't kick him off because they weren't on their land. So basically they squatted on this public lot on Chamberlain Lake, which they picked a really nice windy point and they built those camps there one at a time. Uh, Al supplemented their income with trapping. He had trapping, he trapped all over this country. He, had a, he was a very large, physically, you know, he, when you saw Al Nugent, it's like, you knew you were talking to, talking to somebody. He was a big guy, you know, very strong. It's like Maine's Paul Bunyan, really. He was very strong. I actually did meet him in my early years of working up here. And his line was, nice day. 
it didn't matter if it was 20 below zero and blowing, it was a nice day. Everything was a, was, was a nice day. Al passed away in 78. Patty ran the cabins for another eight years after that, which totaled 50 years for her. We're pretty spoiled. We're not like Patty and yeah. Al, you know, we've got internet and the TV and all the other stuff that we need at the house. So it really doesn't feel like we're in the middle of the woods ourselves, other than we just feel like we live on a really nice lake and have beautiful sunset. We're not living the rough life. No, not like, not the not, way not they like did. Al and Patty did when they moved yeah. out. So it was a lifetime of work for them to, to build those cabins. They didn't have anything to lose. They were two young people. They put everything they had into it and uh, built these cabins from from the logs in the woods and cedar shakes on the roof and, uh, and then they were successful and they built those cabins. It's not for everybody, but it certainly was for them. When it comes to following big footsteps, um, Al's feet were probably, Al, well, Allie and Patty had, had huge feet, you know, to fill and uh, um, I, we're just, we're basically just maintaining what they, what they started. It'll be nice if we can grow old here um, and hopefully we will. It's a beautiful spot to be. Further downriver, you'll find Jal Bear Camps, located on a peninsula on Round Pond. It's called Windy Point. You can feel it right now. You can feel the breeze, kept the fly population down. And what it provides is the escape from the outside world. You don't have cell phone access, and so you have nothing but the breeze that you hear and uh, the loons at night and uh, a chance to, to escape uh, that fast-paced life that most of us live. Built during the World War II era by outdoorsman and wilderness guide Willard Jalbert, affectionately called the old guide by those who knew him, the camps are a rustic reminder of a simpler, quieter time in the waterway. My relationship uh, to this camp is uh, my cousin Phyllis Jalbert uh, has the lease on these camps and her grandfather was uh, Willard Sr. He and uh, three of his friends uh, started at the town of Allagash and uh, came up, uh, up the river. They had to go by the Allagash Falls. They uh, poled and they paddled and they motored and uh, eventually, within two or three days, got to Round Pond. They end up being here uh, for an overnight. They said, well, I think we have found our spot. This is where we're gonna stay. They did some fishing and enjoyed it. And this was in 1941. This place goes back um, approximately uh, 70 plus years. And there's, uh, you know, I, I wish the walls could talk because we, we'd certainly hear some, some good stories. Accessible only by boat or seaplane, the camps managed to attract repeat visitors throughout all four seasons. One of the most famous people that the, the old guide, Willard uh, Sr. guided, was uh, Justice o William O. Douglas. He didn't come here for a hunt. He came here for the canoeing. And in his book, he, he said that in Maine, there are three kinds of bears. There's the brown bear, the black bear, and the jail bear. So, uh, uh, but a pretty, uh, pretty unique uh, history of, of the old guide and, and some of the uh, people that he guided. This cabin here is uh, referred to as the, uh, the main camp. It was the uh, first camp built for uh, housing 
It's, uh, it's uh, typical that we're going to see uh, some bunk beds and uh, a little kitchenette area and uh, two bedrooms uh, located in the back. So you could maximize in here about 10 people. So it's very comfortable in the fall and in the spring. That wood stove and in the winter, of course, uh, that wood stove uh, provides a lot of comfort. When you look at the inside of these uh, camps, not as much in this one as in the cook camp, you have to remember when they first established this, they brought the equipment up, stoves, refrigerators, from the town of Allagash, which is approximately 30 miles downriver. It is remote, but it's a special place. You have access just peace and quiet and, and good recreation. Contacts can be made to get you here. If you want this experience, I doubt very much that you're gonna leave here saying that you never want to come back.